Uh, good morning and welcome to the 16th meeting in 2017 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, we have apologies this morning from the Obibian. Can I ask those who have mobile phones to put them on at least in a mode we, that won't interfere with proceedings? I'm most grateful. And the first item on agenda today is to decide whether to take item three in private. Are members agreed? agreed? We are agreed. The next item on our agenda is to take evidence on the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill's financial memorandum from the Scottish Government Bill team, and I welcome to the meeting Philip Lamont, Patrick Down, and Kevin Philpott. Now, members will have received copies of submissions received on the financial memorandum, so we'll just get straight into questions. Um, so, and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll leave it to Kevin, I think. I think you're the senior. No, Philip. Philip, sorry, Philip, apologies. I knew that because the clerk told me that before we started, and I still got it wrong. But Philip, um, I'll leave it to you to how you decide how you're going to f f field the questions. Um, a, a number of local authorities have obviously, in response to the financial memorandum, raised concerns that the bill might least lead to increased demand, for example, on children's or housing services, and that's and and uh, which isn't really reflected really in the financial memorandum. Other local authorities have provided contrary evidence to say that the financial memorandum represents a reasonably accurate picture. So it would be useful if you could explain to us how you went about producing the financial memorandum, what input service providers had to producing that memorandum, and whether you consider now, in the light of the evidence that has been received, um, whether that requires any amendment. OK. Um, we certainly we started from the, the premise of looking at the direct costs of the bill. So what's in the bill is the creation of a new offence of domestic abuse and there's some auxiliary provisions associated with that. So we were, to a large extent, focused on the direct costs to the justice system of introducing a new criminal offence. Um, we started dialogue with the Crown Office because they are very knowledgeable in terms of the number of current cases that go through the court system in relation to domestic abuse to try and estimate what impact having this new offence will have on the number of cases that um, go through the system. And in order for a case to go through the system, a report has to be made to the police, or indeed it just needs to come to the attention of the police. It then has to be passed to the prosecutor. A decision has to be made to prosecute. There's enough evidence. It goes to court, and then the eventual disposal. So what's laid out in the financial memorandum is very much looking at the, the what we would call the direct costs of having a new offence. Picking up on one of the elements that lo some local authorities have raised, we would accept that there is a gap in relation to criminal justice social inquiry reports, because we are estimating um, around 650 con successful convictions, additional successful convictions a year in relation to domestic abuse. And many of those, indeed, maybe not, if not all of them, will require a criminal justice social inquiry report. So I think that's a fair bit of feedback from local authorities um, in that respect. I think what we would say in respect of some of the other issues raised in terms of support for housing support um, for victims of domestic abuse, etc., while we don't we would acknowledge that the bill may have some sort of impact on that area. We do think that's more of an indirect cost because we are not legislating directly to provide for that support. Um, and indeed, we hope that the creation of the new offence will actually, in due course, lead to less domestic abuse taking place. So there is an argument for saying that while we accept um, and acknowledge the comments made by some local authorities, though not all, as you've indicated, in respect of those indirect costs, we're not entirely convinced that it would be appropriate to put estimates within the financial memorandum because we think those are more indirect costs. Um, but we do accept on the criminal justice social work inquiry reports that would be a direct cost because th those are required where someone has been convicted is a waiting sentence and if the court asks for one, um, criminal justice social work are required to provide one and we are estimating approximately 650 additional convictions a year. So that, that would be a, a, a gap in the financial memorandum when we accept that. Have you managed to cost what that gap would be at this stage? It, we haven't yet costed that. Um, I would say the volume of 650 convictions in a court system, in a criminal justice system, where there's thousands and thousands of convictions, it's not, I wouldn't say it was significant overall, although I do accept for individual local authorities, it may be significant, but still 650 across the whole of Scotland over 12 months, it's not, I wouldn't say it was that significant. Okay. James? 
convener. Um, obviously, what underpins this legislation is that a new offence has been created for domestic abuse in order to capture more incidents of domestic abuse and lead to successful prosecutions. I'm just interested in the, the calculations that underpin the financial memorandum for that. So um, you've come up with a figure for a, a 6% increase in the number of cases that would be taken forward. Can you give a bit of an explanation as to how that 6% was arrived at? Uh, sure. Um, I think we acknowledge that it's difficult to estimate the extent to which the creation of a new offence of domestic abuse will lead to an increase in the number of cases prosecuted in the courts. An increase could arise either from behaviour which is not currently criminal, which it becomes possible to prosecute using the new offence, and just from general increased public awareness of domestic abuse, meaning that victims of domestic abuse are more willing to come forward and report to the police than perhaps they would otherwise be at um, so this central estimate of 6% is based in part on work done by the UK government um, in 2014-15 to estimate the likely impact of uh, the offence of coercing or co controlling or coercive behaviour in an intimate or family relationship. Uh, they arrived at this figure of 6%. Um, their offence is in some respects um, wider than ours in that it covers um, family relationships that aren't between partners. It's, in other respects, we think it's a narrower offence because the, uh, the definition of coercive and controlling behaviour is narrower. Um, but one of the reasons, therefore, in the memorandum that we have given these other estimates of what the effect of a 2% rise or a 10% rise in the number of cases would be is that we accept that there is a fair degree of uncertainty about exactly what the impact of this new offence will be. And I think perhaps a useful bit of background context is um, the number of cases with a domestic abuse marker um, resulting in a conviction uh, recorded by Crown Office in the last 10 years has increased pretty dramatically already. Um, I think there were 10 years ago, there were five, around 5,000, um, and the most recent year, I think there were around 12,000 people convicted of an offence with a domestic abuse marker. Um, now, that might be a sign that the scope for further increase is perhaps not as great as it would otherwise be, but it's, uh, I think we'd acknowledge it's hard to say for certain. How, how confident are you in the 6% figure, bearing in mind from your explanation that basically what you've done is you've taken that from research based on... Um, uh, you know, a, a change at UK level? I, th I think um, we've used the UK government figure and we've also looked at the two areas where we think would drive such an increase. So we think generally the creation of the new offence so that people, perpetrators, victims, family and friends of victims are more aware of what is domestic abuse will drive a general increase in reporting. And that includes things that are already against the law. So cases where abuse is currently going, it under, been undertaken before the law changes, but in the future people will be more willing to come forward. And also, and it, the, the way the offence works is that it extends the criminal law to cover psychological abuse for the first time, um, which can either be very difficult or cannot be prosecuted under the existing law. So the combined effect of those two things, coupled with the experience and the estimates down south, led us to the central estimate of 6%, with the margin of uncertainty 2 to 10%, which is why we've given those figures in the um, financial memorandum. And we know I think Crown Office and Police Scotland, who we work closely with on the financial memorandum, both consider that, and some local authorities as well, consider that to be a reasonable central estimate. Um, I wouldn't overstate it. Um, there is clearly uncertainty and challenge. And one of the areas of uncertainty is because this is not just a new offence that is criminalising behaviour that is not currently criminal. It also captures some behaviour that already is criminal but will be able to be prosecuted in a different way in the future and separating that out from truly new cases that cannot be prosecuted um, is, is very challenging. What would you say to those that say that the figure might appear on the low side on the basis that you calculate that there would be 1,178 um, additional cases brought for prosecution um, whereas the police currently uh, report that they attend 28,198 incidents where no crimes recorded currently. One of the reasons why Police Scotland 
record more incidents of domestic abuse than crimes is because the recording standard for domestic abuse that they use is um, to record any incident that might amount to a crime of domestic abuse. So they are actually required under the recording standard to include incidents of domestic abuse even where a crime has not been committed. So for example, where perhaps a neighbour hears some shouting going on and they get called to a house and then they speak to the parties and they are satisfied no crime has been committed, they will still record that as an incident of, incident of domestic abuse. We are not criminalising that in the future. So we do not think um, out of that 28,000, um, approximately 28,000 cases or incidents of domestic abuse that are not currently recorded as crimes, that, that our offence is going to come along and sweep all those up. We, we think a small proportion will be caught by the new offence. Um, and as you've out outlined, just over 1,000 additional um, cases marked for prosecution each year um, is, the, is the central estimate. Okay, and you, you think that's, that's reasonable, that you know, the new legislation well, will, will, will capture just over 1,000 and these 28,000 cases, that the bulk of them uh, will remain unprosecuted? Well, they'll remain unprosecuted because they're not cri they will not be crimes. Um, the example I've given you there is a, is a rel relatively standard type of example that Police Scotland have to deal with. They, get, they will get called out, or indeed they may just witness it themselves, and they often um, will speak to the parties and they'll come to the conclusion that no crime has been committed, and certainly the way our new offence works, in the example I gave you, a crime would not be committed in that in that situation. But there will be additional cases but of the of the order that we've suggested. Thank you. James Ash. Um, I'd like to refer to the um, evidence that was put in by Scottish Women's Aid because I'm interested in the preventative spend angle. So you might not be able to answer this, but in their um, Scottish Women's Aid evidence, they're suggesting that um, sort of the overall picture of cost to Scotland, so that's in terms of costs um, in provision of public services for violence against women is at £1.6 billion, which is quite staggering in itself. Um, so I think here there's a huge potential, isn't there, for preventative spend in this area. Um, the idea being that if you deal with the perpetrators at an earlier stage, that can act as a deterrent against you know, further offending. And also there's quite a potential for a normative change as well, which could lead to less offending in the future. So I'm wondering, have you done any um, research or is there any evidence on what the value of the preventative spend might be? I think I'd answer that in two ways. In the financial memorandum at paragraph 129, we did reflect at the, the conclusion of the financial memorandum that obviously we hope this new offence in the future will actually lead to a reduction in offending. Now, people who when new offences come forward, I think people who support the policy often say that. And But the, w why we think it will be the case in this context is that for the first time with the new offence, we are seeking to reflect our modern understanding of what domestic abuse is. Currently, domestic abuse is prosecuted under a range of different offences, um, what we call single incident offences. And what this offence is seeking to do is to capture within it the, the way in which more domestic abuse can be carried out, physical abuse, psychological abuse, a mix of the two. And in due course, we hope that that sends um, a very clear signal and greater understanding to victims, yes, so that they understand the justice system can respond to such abuse, but also perpetrators, so they can actually see what they are doing is wrong. Because one of the major issues at present is a lot of perpetrators do not understand or do not, cannot conceive that what they're actually doing is wrong. So we have mentioned that in the financial memorandum. We have not included any specific estimates because it is, as we've already indicated in other areas, it is quite challenging to come up with a specific estimate and we didn't feel it was appropriate to do so, but we have referred to it briefly in the financial memorandum. Um, in terms of the wider prevention agenda, one of the key aims of the additional funding that the Scottish Government committed um, in, from March 2015, the £20 million pounds, um, from the justice budget, has been one of the key themes um, and uses of the money has been to try and prevent future offending. So one area where um, additional funding has been given, which is actually referred to briefly in some of the evidence from local authorities, is the Caledonian system, which is the... Um, the perpetrator programme that exists in some parts of the country where men, primarily men, who um, have been convicted of domestic abuse can 
agree or can be sent on this programme to try and change their future behaviour. Um, and new funding has been given to that last year to improve the operation of the current programme with a view to see whether it can be expanded in other parts of the country. Because, for example, although it does operate in many parts of the country, it doesn't currently operate in Dundee or Glasgow, two of the areas with the, some of the highest um, per head of population rates of domestic abuse. So clearly there's, there's further scope to move forward in that kind of area. Um, in terms of other preventative spend from the £20 million, one of the areas that's been spent is um, a project from the University of Strathclyde to look at um, attitudes on campuses in terms of gender equality um, and indeed there was a, a research report just published last week which showed that there's still quite some way to go in that area and one of the areas that the University of Strathclyde is looking at is to produce a toolkit for use across university um, and higher education institutions in Scotland. So um, I don't think I've directly answered your question um, but clearly the, prevent the prevention agenda, we do think the offence has a role to play in that in the longer term. We're not we're not naive to think that we'll introduce it and suddenly people's behaviour will change overnight. But in due course, as the police, prosecutors and the courts make use of the new offence, we do think that that should help change some people's behaviour so that they can understand what they're doing is wrong and actually appropriate steps can be taken to deal with the behaviour that currently um, cannot be done under the current system. OK, thank you. Now, Phillips raised the issue Caledonian programme was going to bring in Murdo later, but given it's now been introduced to the conversation, um, Murdo, do you want to pick that up now? Yeah, th thank you. Yeah, I wanted to ask around um, the question of cost to local authorities and, and community payback orders. Now, you say in paragraph 77 of the financial uh, memorandum that the average cost of the community uh, payback order is £2,259. In the evidence we have from uh, local authorities, a number of them suggest that, in fact, in the case of domestic abuse, uh, the CPOs there tend to be more expensive and, and require, because they require additional time and resource. The Caledonian programme is referred to now. For example, Dumfries and Galloway Council tell us that uh, not all areas in Scotland are able to, to deliver the Caledonian programme at this particular time. They will have to set up new systems to do that. Uh, and there will be additional cost in, in terms of delivering that compared to the standard uh, CPOs. So I, I wonder if you give me just your, your response to these comments from, from various local authorities. I think this gets, gets us back to what maybe are the direct and indirect implications of the bill. Um, the Cal we're not legislating in, our, um, in the bill in respect of the Caledonian system. It is currently available as a disposal in some areas of Scotland and clearly it's very relevant for this new offence. And the longer term Scottish Government aspiration is for it to be available in more areas um, and that's why funding was given last year to look at the current operation of the Caledonian project to see if it can be expanded in due course and in part that's in the context of this new offence. Um, in respect of a suggestion that new funding won't be needed directly, I mean it very much depends on the process of cases going through court and then decisions made by the court in terms of relevant disposals. Um, but we don't doubt the use of the Caledonian system um, and then of course we will monitor to see if the uptake in the areas where it's currently operating does increase as a result of having uh, of the new offence being on the statute books um, to see whether um, what that means in terms of the funding that is given for the Caledonian project. Um, I think I'm right in saying that currently the Scottish Government gives approximately £2 million a year to fund the Caledonian project and as I said, there was an additional £360,000 given or announced in November over, I think, over about an 18-month period, to, not specifically to deliver the programme, but to look at improving how it operates with a view to seeing whether it can be expanded in, I think, in particular, the two areas I mentioned, Dundee and Glasgow, which it does seem that where you've got two of the areas with the highest incidence of domestic abuse per head, not to have the that such a perpetrator programme available to the court as a disposal does seem something that um, should be addressed if possible. Okay, th thank you for that. But just so I'm clear, would you accept the general principle that a community payback order for domestic abuse tend to be more expensive to deliver than general community payback orders? Well, I mean, the, the work that was done, I think, in 2014-15 to look at the average cost of a CPU obviously includes within that a lot of CPOs that will include domestic abuse cases. I'm not aware of any specific work that shows explicitly that 
a CPO relating to a domestic abuse case is higher than an average CPO. So I, I couldn't confirm that. And I do note that I think one, at least one local authority did say that it was appropriate to use the general average that was produced in 2014-15. Um, but I wouldn't I don't have enough information to disagree with what you're saying, but I can necessarily agree with it if that makes sense. Right. Okay. Thank you. Marie. Thank you, Premier. Um, I was interested in the um, evidence from the Highlands that was submitted to us, um, just that they were quite clearly able to identify um, potential savings, and that was in contrast to some of the other um, council areas. I just wondered, and it may not be something that you can answer, but just when I was reading through the evidence, I noticed that the Edinburgh Council mentioned things like associated costs of the name person scheme that might come from this. And I know that Highland's been running the named person scheme for a very long time and had very solid evidence that actually it reduced costs at the end of the day and focused um, resource where it was required. I wonder if you would be able to give me any comments on that. Um. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I did, we did find it quite interesting, the divergence, actually, in some local authorities, the way they've approached giving evidence um, in terms of the, the way, the potential for savings. Um, it's not something that was raised with us as we... In, in terms of the preparation of the bill, there was two separate consultations, and one of the consultations did ask for views from stakeholders in relation to the financial impact of having a new offence of domestic abuse. Um, and although quite a few local authorities did reply, some of the information they're now providing is a little bit different, or certainly more extensive than they did when we did the consultation. So. To a, to a limited extent, we were a little bit hamstrung when we were producing the financial memorandum, not having the information. I think I would maybe suggest also, though, that um, I'm not again sure that I would call... In, in, where it's a, a provision of a service to a victim of domestic abuse, is that a direct cost of what we're doing in the bill? It, they are already being abused at the present time. Um, in the future, we hope the justice system, through the new offence, can more appropriately hold the perpetrator to account. But does that necessarily mean there are then direct costs associated? Um, we, we took the view that it wouldn't be appropriate to try and estimate those because we don't think they're necessarily direct costs. But we do acknowledge that, in, in a general way, if more people are able to come forward and seek to engage with the justice system by making reports, it may also be that there's other knock-on implications of that. Um, but I'm, I'm not able to give you a specific comment in terms of the, the, the information from the Highlands compared to other areas, I'm afraid. OK, thank you. Uh, Patrick. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I wanted to uh, explore uh, very similar issues. Um, I, I appreciate what you, you're saying about the... Um, the desire to focus only on direct costs that are uh, immediately connected to the legislation itself being passed uh, rather than to other services and the indirect impacts. But repeatedly throughout the, the memorandum, the following phrase is used, it is not anticipated that there will be any new costs following on other bodies, individuals or businesses as a result of the new offence. That seems to imply that not only that you're not looking at the question of indirect costs, but you think there aren't any. Is, is that an accurate reading of that sentence? Um, I think that sentence could have more appropriately been worded, we do not estimate or anticipate there will be any direct cost arising from what's in the bill. Um, but I appreciate that, that what you've read out there could be qualified slightly. So is it is it the view of the government that you would agree with uh, the comments from Scottish Women's Aid and others um, when they talk about, uh, they say, uh, undoubtedly there will be increased requests for refuge accommodation uh, and direct support for women and children by workers, resulting on increased pressure on local women's aid groups already under, uh, already, uh, increased pressure on women, local women's aid groups already strained resources. Uh, and they said that this is an issue that requires to be addressed by the Scottish Government and local authorities in order to support valuable and valued women's aid services. Is that something the government agrees with? I think the government would acknowledge that if more people have confidence that the justice system is going to deal appropriately with domestic abuse and that results in more reports being made, which we estimate within the financial memorandum, that may have knock-on indirect implications for a range of services provided by local authorities and the third sector. Um, because at the moment, there, there, I am sure there are people 
who are in a position where they don't feel they can go anywhere in terms of the abuse they're suffering. And if they have more competence in the future to engage with the, with the authorities, whether that's the police or indeed just going to Scottish Women's Aid Direct or to local authority, that, that could have um, implications for them. I would come back, however, that we are creating a new offence of domestic abuse and I still think there's a, a separation between what we are doing and then those knock-on implications. Perhaps, but, uh, sorry. sorry, go on. I'd perhaps add that women's aid groups will at the moment almost certainly provide support to victims of domestic abuse who may never report the abuse to the police, mm. either because the, ex the abuse they're experiencing can't easily be prosecuted under the existing law or simply because for whatever reasons they don't wish to get involved with the criminal justice system. So some of these costs... Um, will be costs that are already being incurred by third sector groups like Women's Aid because the fact that behaviour is occurring may be enough to get somebody to go to a group like Women's Aid even if they're not wishing to engage with the justice system. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly uh, e easy to argue that there may be individual cases uh, which might be subject to prosecution in future but which are not currently. Uh, where there are support services being provided, but the, the organisations providing the support services are very clear in their evidence that they anticipate not just an increased number of referrals, uh, but the potential for uh, longer term support being needed uh, for uh, victims in, in particularly complex cases, uh, and also uh, associated training costs to uh, services to deal with the, the issues being uh, identified here. So. Even if the government takes the view that these shouldn't be reflected specifically and directly in the financial memorandum, is it the intention of the government at some point to assess those costs and provide for them? Well, clearly, ministers will keep under review the funding arrangements for third sector organisations to look at a range of factors and any new pressures that may arise, which may be indirectly as a result of this new legislation, will clearly be kept um, and factored into the future spending reviews and budget processes. Um, but I, I wouldn't want to, I, I don't think I feel I could commit on behalf of ministers at that point. A decision will be taken by them in, at the appropriate time as budgets are being set. Okay, thank you. Um, Ivan? Uh, I think my points have been covered. Okay, Willie. Um, I wonder if I could ask you to, to confirm, I think they would say you accepted that uh, you had perhaps not estimated the additional cost of criminal justice social work reports and so on. Is that will that now go forward and will the memorandum be um, amended in, in light of that? I think there's within the, the standing orders of the Parliament. I think the, the financial memorandum can I think be revised after stage two. Mm. Um, I'm not sure it's actually able to be revised, but what we could do is certainly. I'll, I obviously take guidance from the Parliament, but we could certainly write a letter to the committee to clarify, once we looked into it, what we think those additional costs may be so that you have the full information. OK. So, because if you look at the two Ayrshire submissions, you'll see that North Ayrshire provided some detail about what their estimate of additional costs would be. Uh, East Ayrshire were pretty much content with the estimates, but, but did point out if there were additional criminal justice report costs, that would, they would expect that to be forthcoming. Um, could you just say a wee bit about the North Ayrshire submission, because their, their estimate of £137,000 extra that they would require is quite a substantial part of your estimate for the entire cost for the whole of Scotland. Yep. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> so is it North Ayrshire Council, Aye. number eight? Okay. You can see in their paragraph four, yeah, they've highlighted four additional cost areas, the, the total of which comes to about £137,000, which is a substantial amount compared to your own estimate for the whole country. And obviously we can consider in detail what North Ayrshire have said in paragraph four. Um, reading, reading it, um, some of it, again, I think falls into this kind of direct, indirect cost argument. Um, 
it. So I think we would need to look carefully, but I mean, many of the things that are in, in, included in the North Ayrshire summary, um, I certainly don't doubt um, that work goes on in these areas in North Ayrshire, um, but these, these services already exist, and it's whether you can say the new offence will directly lead to these additional costs or additional costs in this area. Um, but clearly we're happy to look into it, and maybe in the letter that we'll send on the criminal justice social work it, um, costs, we can respond in detail to the, the, what North Ayrshire have said um, and give further information that might be helpful to the committee. OK. Um, I, I didn't see a submission from South Ayrshire. Uh, do you know if they submitted or whether it's just not been included? Uh, Is that complete list? list? But it was it was to us that they responded. The yeah. council to the, the committee's call for evidence. It wasn't the government's call for evidence. Yeah, but did South Ayrshire respond? Uh, it doesn't doesn't, oh, look, yeah. doesn't look like it on the list okay. of uh, respondees. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, well saved. <laughs> <laughs> Is that everything concluded? Well, thank you very much. I thank officials for coming along today and giving us some very useful evidence in terms of the financial memorandum. We'll obviously consider how we respond to the day's evidence taken session. At the start of the meeting, the committee agreed to take item, the next item in private. I therefore now close the public part of the meeting. The next meeting of the committee will take place on the 14th of June, when we expect to take evidence in relation to the constitutional aspects of the committee's remit. I suspend the meeting to allow public and officials to leave. And we'll just keep going.